Hello and welcome to News Click, to our new episode of a program which we normally do it in Hindi, Itihas Ke Panne, Meri Nazar Se. But this time we'll be doing it in, in English, so it is going to be Pages from History, The Perspective is Mine. There is rarely a public lecture or a speech in which Prime Minister Narendra Modi or any of his Bharti Janta Party leaders, whenever they deliver, they always attack opposition parties for being dynastic. It almost appears that the BJP is not at all a dynastic party and that it is only the opposition parties which have political dynasties running in it. But is this correct? It certainly is not a very correct picture because dynasties do not mean a party which is actually managed or which has dynastic elements within it does not mean only the leadership is in succession. The point is that is or are there enough lawmakers who are part of what we call political families or are they eyes of political families? If we actually go by that, then we find that within the Bharti Janta Party, there is a huge proportion of lawmakers, members of the Lok Sabha and of Rajya Sabha. No studies have really been done except for the Lok Sabha by, uh, you know, scholars. And today we will be actually joined by a very important scholar, Roma Kaleva, who has done a PhD on Dynasties and Democracy in Contemporary India, an empirical study 1952 to 2015. He submitted his PhD in 2018 and is currently at the Hong Kong City University where he teaches uh, you know, Asian affairs. He is a historian and he's focused essentially on, on Indian history and looked at political dynasties in India right up to the 16th Lok Sabha, which is 20, 2014 to 2019, that period. So we'll primarily be talking with Roma about political dynasties in India, whether the BJP's claim of not being a dynastic party, in fact, the Union Home Minister Amit Shah claims that one of the major achievements of the BJP is that they have finished political dynasties from India. The truth, however, is something slightly different. For instance, if you look at the Central Council of Ministers, there are at least five ministers who are eyes of political families in the cabinet as well as within the Minister of States. It is not just only in politics where you find a dominance of the uh, political dynasties. Very recently, reports have also appeared that the Board of Cricket Council of India, at least one third of them holding important positions, come from people who are either from political families or who are part of cricketing families. The General Secretary of the BCCI, Mr. Jay Shah, he is the son of Amit Shah. Likewise, I can actually reel out several names. You have Arun Dhumal, who is the treasurer. He's the brother of Anurag Thakur, a cabinet minister who is also the son of a former chief minister of the BJP of Himachal Pradesh. So you understand how deep dynasties are running. You also have the son of Jyoti Raditya Sindhya, who is now a treasurer of the Gwalior uh, Cricket uh, Control uh, Cricket Committee. Now, Jyoti Raditya Sindhya's father, Madhara Sindhya, was also at some one point the president of the BCCI. So, dynastism and the BJP runs very deep. There is a long tradition to it. Talking about it is going to be Roma Kaleva, who has actually spent several months while he was doing his PhD here. So, welcome to the program and uh, thank you very much for coming and joining uh, us here at a fairly short notice. What we definitely must begin trying to understand from you is that what is a dynastic party? Would we say that, as some scholars say, that it is only those parties where the leadership is, you know, 
you know, is a, is dynastically inherited, like, for instance, the Congress party, you know, where you have the Sonia Gandhi or Rahul Gandhi or Akhilesh Yadav, you know, who's taken over from his father. Likewise, similar, several other parties, the DMK, Shiv Sena, you can keep on citing one uh, political party after another. Or would you say that even the BJP, where the top leadership, the president, the prime ministers may not be, you know, you know, succession, succession principle, but uh, definitely a large number of uh, lawmakers, members of the Lok Sabha, members of the Rajya Sabha, and now members of legislative assemblies and legislative councils across India. A large number of them are from political families. Thanks for having me, Lenonjan. It's, it's very good to be here with you today. Um, I agree it's a, it's, a very, it's a very good question to ask whether the BJP, which claims never to have been uh, a dynastic party because of a lack of um, a, a dynastic succession at the top, um, is a, a by and large plays on, playing on terms here. I like, to, I like to divide dynastic parties into dynastic leadership parties and dynastic membership parties. And you can right. easily do um, a, a, a double entry table where you would have parties with, for example, a dynastic leadership and a dynastic membership. And that would be, for example, the INC, the, the, the Congress party has had, of course, since 1929, since Jawaharlal Nehru followed his father, Motilal Nehru, at the head of right. uh, the INC, a long succession, of course, of members of the Gandhi family at the, at the helm. Um, and that's why, of course, um, uh, the BJP likes to claim that they are uh, doing a fantastic job at, at ridding India from dynastic parties because of the loss uh, that they've inflicted upon the Congress party. Um, there are, however, um, parties that haven't had a dynastic leadership but I've had dynastic membership, a large proportion of their Lok Sabha uh, uh, members coming from uh, uh, political dynasties. And that, of course, is exactly where the BJP founds itself. There's never been a succession at the top of, um, at the, top of the BJP from within uh, a same family. Um, but by most accounts today in the Lok Sabha, about 20 to 25% of its, of its members, BJP, a, a member of the Lok Sabha, are from uh, political dynasties. It seems very difficult um, to say that the party that is one in four of its MPs from a political family is not dynastic in any way. So it's a Thank bit you. playing on terms. Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, your thesis, you know, if I was uh, to, uh, you know, inform our uh, uh, viewers a bit, you know, it actually looks at Indian politics through various phases, you know, you divide it into different phases. And uh, what we definitely find, you know, your basic findings are that prior to 1989, which definitely is possibly the a very important watershed year in the development of Indian electoral and uh, political uh, history of India. Uh, 1989 is the time when the BJP actually makes and, you know, marks a very significant presence within the national politics. Prior to that, from the year 1980 that it was formed, it was not a very important political party. It just had about two members of parliament between 84 and 89. In its previous aftar at the Jansan, it also did not do very well except in 19. Uh, 67 when it won a fairly large number of seats. So we have had these periods, you know, where the majority of you established through your empirical study that the major number of IAs of political families came from the Congress. But after 1989, the situation started changing, you know, even though politics in India took a dramatically a different turn from 1989. First, we had the long coalition era and then from 2014. We have seen, I do not know whether this is a permanent, but the era of one again, once again, single party dominance. But yes, dynastism has continued even after 1989. The number of the percentage of the Congress who have hired from political families might have gone down, but the others have come up. You, you in your PhD have established that in the 16th Lok Sabha, 
the BJP had as many as 40, nearly 45 percent of the total number of dynasts who were members of the Lok Sabha at that time. So we so we find that despite the BJP saying that it is a party with a difference, by and large, would you say that they have continued with the same political culture? I will come to the new phase now that where previously they were building only the Hindu right-wing families and their leaderships and their next generations. But now they've even started looking outside. We'll look at that phenomenon a bit later. But post-1989, the BJP's character, what were you main findings? Um, there's, a clear, yeah, there's, a clear, there's a clear divide before and after 1989. Um, mm -hmm. One of which is the kind of political dynasties that they've had. Um, it's important to understand that historically there's been um, a by and large two sources of political dynasties um, in India after independence. And that used to be on the one hand, the former princes, princely families that entered politics after the absorption of their states um, within the Indian Union. Um, and on the other hand, former freedom fighters, for the freedom fighters and their families. And of course, once again, the example of the Nehru Gandhi's come to mind, Jawaharlal Nehru, for all of his, um, uh, for his incredible legacy um, during his lifetime was known um, um, as uh, Motilal Nehru's uh, son, first and foremost. And so those two categories of, um, of dynast, princes on the one hand, free, former freedom fighters on the other hand, dominate by and large the period until 1989, and I argue even after that. Um, mm -hmm. What's interesting is that uh, prior to 1989, there were uh, political dynasties within Hindu, uh, within Hindu right parties, the Hindu Mahasabha, the Jansan, yes. but overwhelmingly, they were former princes. And uh, in my studies, I define all former princes as, as dynasts, as political heirs, even if they right. were the first in their family to be elected because they are the, the descendants of uh, divinely anointed kings. And obviously your family names and family ancestry matters a lot um, when you are elected and when you're a former prince, right? And so the difference I think between before 1918 and after, 19, uh, after 1989, um, within uh, the dynastic contingent of the BJP is that, by and large, many more non-princely dynasts get elected after 1989. The proportion of former princes within the BJP dynastic contingent declines dramatically as basically the, the sons, the daughters, the spouses, etc., etc., uh, 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 nieces and nephews in, in the cases of, of um, um, uh, BJP leaders who did not have uh, children mm -hmm. uh, start getting elected. So I think that there's a generational element here too that changes the demographic uh, uh, makeup of those uh, dynasties for the BJP. You know, I just want to add, you know, basically for the benefit of our viewers, you know, you were talking about the Hindu right and the dynasts uh, from there, you know, coming from princely backgrounds. You know, there are two political dynasties which I very specifically wish to refer to because they are of a slightly different kind, you know, in the sense that the first one, you know, is the, the, the dynasty of the Sindhyas. Now, it started basically with uh, Rajmata Vijay Raja Sindhya, you know, she was the Dowager Queen, you know, originally when the Congress wanted uh, somebody from the Sindhya family to become a member of parliament. The offer was made to her husband, but he was not interested in entering politics. It eventually was Rajmata who, who became a member of parliament. And then she was initially, you know, with the Swatantra Party. And then, you know, there was a period when she was halfway into Swatantra Party and as well as within the Jansan, you know, that is how it come, came in. Then you had her son, you know, who came but did not, you know, initially starting with the Jansang, but then thereafter made the transition to the Congress because during emergency it suited him to be with the Congress and he continued with the Congress for the rest of his life, except that period in the 1990s when he went on the other side. And then after his death, you know, his son Jyotiraditya Sindhya, he entered politics and continued to be in the Congress 
till definitely for reasons you know that uh, there wasn't really much to be had while continuing in the congress he very recently uh, you know just a couple of years ago he he switched over to the bjp so you have had that family you know where you have had the grandmother starting now you have the fourth generation as i was talking in the in the cricket board of uh, the cricket committee of gwalior state and i'm sure that he is going to rise higher in the cricketing hierarchy and then eventually get into politics once uh, jyotiraditya thinks that it is time to pass on the baton to his son the other family which is also very interesting is not a family within the uh, you know in the biological sense of the word it's a spiritual family you have the uttar pradesh chief minister yogi adityanath who initially started with the bjp but he he is the head of the gorak uh, gorakdham math in gorakhpur his predecessor his spiritual father if i can actually use the word was uh, you know mahant avedyanath and whose uh, predecessor was mahant digvijaynath one of the persons who was instrumental in uh, forcibly installing the idol inside the babri mosque in ayodhya way back in december 1949 so this is a spiritual family which started from the hindu mahasabha and as you were saying that it was not just the jansang but also people coming from the entire hindu right so that is something very important which we have to see but now is a third phase within the bjp which we are seeing is that it is not just who came from the princely stage or from the spiritual families uh, and also the who were actually home grown from within the sang network but they are now beginning to look outside also and they are poaching into political dynasties of other parties we can start actually reading out names you know one after another of the number of congress families whose eyes have been drawn into the bjp and they have been given nominations to contest elections so how do you see that this congressization of the bjp and also the embrace of political dynasties of the congress and other parties also within it that's a multiple part question and there are fascinating yes. things to say about all of this um let me start at, at the end and work my way backwards um I think at the core of uh, the issue of political dynasties in India rests the issue of trust or the lack of trust um within Indian politics in general. Um I remember when I was when I was a master student <clears> and I I submitted my um uh, my master's memoirs on political dynasties in central India, Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh which revolved a lot around the Singhia family of course. Yes. Massive massively important massively powerful princely family uh in Madhya Pradesh um i i i tossed out in my in my master's memo that that clearly it was um in large part because um there were far less uh, loyalty within indian parties than in than in other um than in other democracies um uh, my typical example would be that in 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 france or in the us um if a politician on the left on the left of the left wing of the of the ideological spectrum were to cross the aisle and join a right wing party he would very uh, uh he would uh, he would very often be criticized as a traitor for the for the rest of his political life and it would be a, a major liability because um because the the parties in such a system are quite far apart ideologically speaking um and that in the indian political system just hopping from one party to the other has never been seen um in the same light it's never it's never been seen as a major sin um and and when i was a, a master student my uh, my my uh, uh, a supervisor basically asked me can you can you prove that can you prove that there's that there's less loyalty within indian politics than um than in other democracies and at the time i couldn't and i was quite stumped because it seemed fairly obvious to me but i couldn't prove it um one of the things i did for my for my for my phd research then was to was to try and prove that and i proved that i show that amongst um um all political families founders of political families mm-hmm. and uh heirs by and large half of them change party at least once uh okay. in their political 
half of all uh, politicians that I've analyzed for my study change party at a point or another. And therefore, I argue that to explain the strength of political dynasties in, in India and to ex uh, explain the fact that lots of party organize themselves around ruling family um, is at the core an issue of trust. If you can't trust your underlings that are elected with you in your party to stay with you if things turn bad, um, it's a logical thing to actually invest in your family, to give important titles, to give important position, to give important constituencies to members of your families, because you're less likely to be betrayed by a member of your close family um, than you are by a complete stranger. And so that helps explain uh, that helps explain, I think, why um, dynasties have become so important um, in India. I think, you know, that in your PhD thesis, you know, you have try to argue that, that you have spoken about that there is a mutually reinforcing relationship between dynasticism, the dynasties, and democracy, that they feed on each other. Can you elaborate on it, that how does this happen? And then also, you know, that do dynasties in any way threaten the democratic uh, character of Indian politics? It's a complex relationship. The, the relationship between democracy and dynasticism in India is a very, is a very complex one. Um, dynasticism is as, as old as Indian democracy or older. Um, the reason, once again, um, that you had that you had dynasties right from the beginning, right from yes. the 1952 Lok Sabha, is in part because a uh, half of that dynastic phenomenon was former princes that already right. that already held political power, and the other was uh, freedom fighters. Um, the only politicians in the land in 1952 were either freedom fighters of, or, or princes. Or princes. Right? And the, yes. fight for, the fight for independence had been going on for 50 to 70 years by that point, right. meaning that entire families of freedom fighters um, uh, had yeah. developed, had fought as families. So And, and the they had a legitimate had, claim to be part of, of the lawmaking process. An independent thing. Absolutely. You, you can't deny the political genius and impact of someone okay. like, like Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, he was his father's son, but he was also one of the most important leaders of, of, the, of the Indian freedom struggle. Okay. Uh, so that's one thing. And, and I always like to make the point that Indian politics did not sort of devolve slowly over time into dynasticism. It started like that. The very first politicians in the land were the former princes and families right. of freedom fighters. So it started right from the beginning, right? The and other the thing BJ that I think is, it, yes. BJP also started that way, you know, the Jansang at that time, you point in your thesis, you know, even in the first uh, house, even though they won very few number of seats, you know, 52 onwards, you know, the very few seats that they won, they used to have a fair amount of people who arise of political families. Mm. And so, to link that back to the issue of trust in politics, um, yes. because the fight against the British was the only fight that mattered um, at the beginning, everyone was gathered within the, the Indian National Congress, and there was lots of ideological disagreement within the Indian National Congress, which means that all of the uh, parties that would come um, uh, that would that would uh, um, uh, oppose the Congress. Um, in the in the sixties and the seventies, all came out of uh, of the National Congress. Right, the, the founder of the right. Jansong was a cabinet in uh, was a cabinet minister in Nehru's first cabinet. Exactly. Right? The issue of trust, therefore, uh, yes. uh, get explained once again there. Right, if all of your if you're of your the new opposition parties are all coming from the Indian National Congress, all coming from your own party from your own fold. Switching party is never seen as a terrible, terrible thing, and therefore you have very little trust in in, in members of your party who are not members of your family. Um, and you mentioned the senior family, which is which is interesting because they have this they have this sort of um, uh, opposite uh, uh, opposite path. Uh, the Rajmata uh, Vijayaraji Sindhya um, very likely was more ideologically in sync with the Hindu Mahasabha when she was basically right. co opted. 
by the Congress Party. The Congress Party does this thing in the 1950s, particularly around 1957, of co-opting the former princes. And one of the reasons they do that is uh, because the, the areas that were the weakest and where the Hindu right is the strongest is former princes. So that's right. very clear in that's very clear in Madhya Pradesh, where the only two seats that they don't pick up in at the time Madhya Bharat, um, and they get picked up by the Hindu Mahasabha, are actually part of the former Gwalior state. Exactly. Former exactly. Gwalior princely state. And so that's how the Rajmana gets co-opted, but she's not a very it's, good ideological fit. And then she de- basically breaks off and joins the Chan Song. And her son does the opposite. Uh, Madhav Rao Sindhya is a fascinating character too, starts being recruited by his mother uh, within yes. the Chan Song. And then later on, I, I think he doesn't, it doesn't, he's not a very good ideological fit and decides to uh, first become an independent and then join. Yeah, he uh, also, he also the didn't want to be fall foul of Indira Gandhi during emergency. That is the time when he, mm. he actually crossed over from the Jansang to the Congress fold. It happened during the yeah. emergency that, that period. Right. So it is basically a matter of convenience. Now, what we are finding is, you know, as I come to the concluding part of our discussion, is that there is, we have seen that after 1989, the BJP has a fairly large number of eyes of political families who are lawmakers. We at least have some empirical data, thanks to you, of the Lok Sabha, right up to the 16th Lok Sabha. Despite that, the BJP in its campaigns and in its speeches has a very righteous way of presenting the others as being dynastic and itself as a non-dynastic political party. Now, how uh, you know honest is such a portrayal according to you? And to what extent, how do you think... Or, or rather, you know, let me ask, you know, do you think that dynastics, uh, eyes of political families are actually a reality who are never going to go away from Indian politics? That's incredibly difficult to say, of course. Um, what we can see from the American case, for example, is that with time, uh, the dynasties have declined. There are lots of there are lots of dynasties within the U.S. Congress and with time they decline in numbers. It's difficult to say where we're at um, 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 in India's uh, in India's path. Of course, um, I will say that for the for the BJP, the reason they can still argue, of course, that they're not a dynastic party is as long as they don't have a dynastic succession at the top, they can they can still pretend they can still hide the fact that twenty to twenty five percent of their members of parliament are actually from political dynasties. The other thing that I'll say, and that answers part of your last question that you asked me about co-opting um, other uh, other dynasties from, from other, other parties, from other parties, yeah, mm, is that by and large the BJP does that at at, at sort of like a, a important leaders. Uh, 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 the latest Sindhya is a is a is a fantastic is a fantastic pick for the BJP. Uh, but by and large, the rise of dynasties within their rank um, is homegrown. Um, they they take deserters, defectors once in a while, but most of the effect, most of the numbers um, of their dynasty in parliament are are homegrown. Um, and by and large, the proportion of dynasties that they have in comparison to their MPs, it sort of it sort of uh, uh, remains. Um, uh, 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 remains constants, I think. What you saw with the Congress over the past over the past few um, over the past few Lok Sabhas is that um, they basically most of the seat that they won were won by dynasts. So the progression of dynasts of uh, um, um, uh, amongst Congress MPs kept rising um, in the 2020s. It's not quite the case with the BJP because they've got they, they're winning so much more seats, of course, that they managed mm-hmm. to dilute a little bit um, those homegrown dynasts that they mm-hmm. have, and they don't seem to be necessarily using dynast first and foremost to to win. Um, they're just they're just uh, uh, the rise of more dynasts within the BJP simply tracks with the rise of of a uh, 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 BJP True. MPs in general. True. No, what you say definitely does, uh, you know, make sense, you know, that 
maybe the BJP is not as much dynastic as the Congress or as some of the regional parties were. But we then also have to factor the fact... It's less a deliberate has, strategy. Uh, it's less yeah, of it, a deliberate strategy than it was with the Congress, I think. Yeah, yeah, possible. But then we also have to take into account that a large number of the allies of the BJP are also run completely on the dynastic principle. In fact, even their leadership is on the matter of succession. So BJP really cannot insulate itself of having cut out dynasticism and dynastic politics. It definitely you know, plays ball with dynastic politics as much as any other political party uh, has done. But definitely because it requires a certain you know, point to, to pin down the Congress especially and a few other parties. That is why it keeps on referring to dynasties. But actually, you know, empirical studies like yours and by a few other scholars definitely does establish that the BJP's claim of being a non-dynastic party is absolutely not true. Thank you, Roma, for coming and joining me on this program. My pleasure. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a very important subject on which we normally get only a one-sided view led by the BJP. And thank you for coming and pointing out the other nuanced aspects of this entire issue, a very important issue in Indian politics. Thank you so much once again. Bye-bye. My pleasure, Niranjan.